As you guys know, I am a huge proponent of context when we talk about training. Everything regarding rep ranges, number of sets, intensity, exercise selection, and other training variables are going to be different depending on the individual, his goals, and his style of training. That is why it really bothers me when people who supposedly should know more than everybody else in the industry give stupid statements that have a complete lack of nuance such as dead lifts are bad for hypertrophy or pull-ups are not optimal. Which, by the way, just quick little tip, deadlifts. If you're if you're deadlifting to be a better deadlifter, fine. If you're not doing that for deadlift's sake, then don't fucking do it. The risk to reward ratio is a joke. For deadlifts? For deadlifts. Really? And a lot of people aren't going to like that I'm saying that. Movements that have been time-tested and under certain circumstances are an even better choice than their counterparts. It seems that college is a scam because otherwise... How could we explain these incorrect, reductionist, and controversial statements? Oh, yeah, that explains it. Well, I am here to defend these movements from the greedy PhDLs and put an end to this dumb idea. Grab your protein shakes, throw your turkestron bottles in the trash, and let's begin. Something that I have been seeing in the community at large is this idea of trying to buy a certain compound movements in a way that they are optimal for hitting a certain muscle group. For example, what we will often see is replacing pull-ups by iliac pull-downs or very gimmicky variations of a lat pull-down. And when it comes to the deadlift, we usually see people going from conventional to a stiff-legged or a Romanian deadlift. And although this is a powerful tool when it comes to bringing up lying areas, especially for very advanced lifters, the truth of the matter is that they are called compound movements for a reason. They are meant to hit more than one muscle at a time. It's okay to slightly bias a movement towards a certain area. For example, making a row more upper back biased or making a pull up more lat biased and vice versa. The issue lies when you obsess over biasing a movement to the point that you're basically turning it into an isolation movement defeating the purpose of doing a compound movement in the first place. When you're doing pull-ups or deadlifts, you should not be thinking, oh, I'm going to specifically target the hamstrings. No, it should be something more like, I'm going to target the upper back, I'm going to target the hamstrings, I'm going to target the glutes, and in a lesser degree, other muscle groups like the stabilizers. If you wanted to just target your hamstrings, you would do a hamstring isolation movement and not a compound movement that targets the hamstrings. Same goes with pull-ups. Say you want to bias a pull-up towards the lats. That's actually a good idea if you're very upper back dominant. Because a slight bias is going to allow you to hit an area that often gets under-stimulated. The same goes with triceps biasing on presses by shortening the grip. When you do this, you don't expect the movement to magically turn into a triceps isolation. You expect it to hit the triceps more, but still hit the other muscle groups. Why? because it is a fucking compound movement, and that's the point. They are meant to allow you to hit a lot of areas and work a lot of joint positions at the same time. Of course, some areas are going to get hit more than others. On a bench press, your chest is the one that is going to be the limiting factor, and not your shoulders. On OHP, your shoulders will be the limiting factor, and on diamond push-ups, your triceps will. But all of them will feed tension to the same muscles just in different proportions. Only after doing the compounds, if you want to add extra stimulation to certain parts of your body, you can do so via isolation movements. So when someone tells you, hey, when you do a pull-up, you're not working the lats, but also the upper back and rear delts, you look at them straight in the eye and you tell them, yes. This right here is my favorite thing ever in the history of forever. I think about this every day. I think about this all night long. I stay awake, not sleeping, because I'm thinking about this. Even though the concept of progressive overload has been bastardized in the last few years, it still stands that the more you progress on movement, the more the prime movers are going to grow. The secondary movers as well, but less. We know that we can apply progression via weight, reps, technique improvements, and tempo manipulation. We also know that some movements are more progressible than others. For example, the bench press progresses faster than an overhead press. 
both in terms of relative progression, so in terms of percentages, and in terms of absolutes. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Usually, the more general a movement is, the more progressible it becomes in all of these factors. For example, the behind-the-neck press works all of the heads of the shoulders, some traps, and some triceps. Meanwhile, a lateral raise mostly targets the side delts. It is far more likely to progress in any of the previously mentioned ways with a behind-the-neck press than with a lateral raise. So, comparing compounds like pull-ups and deadlifts to more isolation-type movements like iliac pull-downs, we can see that a huge benefit that the first ones offer is a higher progressibility, growing more overall muscle than their optimal counterparts. But the first ones have a worse stimulus to fatigue ratio. Don't worry, little nerd, we're going to tackle this right now. A popular word or term that has emerged in the fitness industry is the stimulus to fatigue ratio. The basic premise of this concept is that some movements will offer more fatigue to simulate a certain muscle group compared to others. To give an example, we have a barbell row and a chest supported row, like a machine row. If your goal is to simulate the upper back, then you won't be able to do as many sets of barbell rows compared to chest supported rows, due to the fact that with the first one you're using more weight and you're also taxing the lower back. Meanwhile, with the chest supported row, you take the lower back and some stabilizers out of the picture. Therefore, you end up using less weight and you're able to just target the upper back, making the movement more specific. This idea is a really good concept to apply when it comes to bodybuilding. But as with every tool that we are offered, we need to learn how to properly use it. Let's break it down. The stimulus of a movement is going to be mainly dictated by the range of motion that the muscle is taken through, and the resistance curve of said range of motion. A movement with a lengthened bias is going to have a higher amount of stimulus per rep than a concentric focused movement. On the other side, the fatigue aspect is going to be determined mainly by how much weight you are using. As we can see, these two are interacting with one another because the higher range of motion, by default, implies that you're going to be using less weight. And it also applies to other factors like tempo and the resistance curve. So supposing these factors remain equal when comparing two movements side by side, the thing that is going to dictate whether you're going to use more or less weight is going to be how many muscles are worked in tandem with the target muscle group. In other words, how specific the movement is. An isolation movement is going to have a better stimulus to fatigue than a biased compound, but a biased compound is going to have a better stimulus to fatigue than a regular compound. So basing ourselves out of SFR, we should only do isolations, right? Of course not. Common sense and the natural lifters that have been successful in growing their bodies prove this otherwise. But this is exactly the mistake that science-based lifting is committing. For people that have postdoctorates on the matter, they surely don't understand how stimulus to fatigue works. Funnily enough, these were the same individuals that were making fun of meatheads on roids doing cable isolations to grow every single part of their body. So protein man, how should I use stimulus to fatigue ratio then? Well, my little Padawan, I'm going to give you my answer. You use compound movements that have a poor stimulus to fatigue ratio as heavy hitters, as movements that are going to target everything you want to target on that specific day at once. Obviously, since you're going to be using a lot of weight, if you were to do a lot of volume, you would get fatigued really easily and wouldn't be able to recover appropriately. What I want you to do is slow volume with it, like 10 to 15% of your total sets, and even take some reps in reserve. Then, as the session goes on, you start using movements that have a higher and higher stimulus to fatigue ratio, i.e. movements that are going to target specific areas in a way that is less demanding to your body. Having a movement that will drive progression in all of these areas and then focusing more and more on the areas you want to improve. To serve the purpose of this video, I will show you how to do it with deadlifts. If your goal is to grow the hamstrings, you would start off the session with two sets of heavy deadlifts in the 3 to 5 or 4 to 6 rep range, leaving 2 to 3 reps in the tank. Then you move on to two sets of Romanian deadlifts for 6 to 8, and finally you finish off the session with 2 to 3 sets of hamstring curls. 
Alternatively, if your goal was to target the upper back, you could start off with deadlifts, move on to barbell rows, and then to inverted rows or even shrugs. This is how SFR is applied. This argument is the most used by these types of people, saying that deadlifts or pull-ups are not good for hypertrophy due to the fact that they are too unstable and therefore you cannot produce maximal force with the target muscle groups. What they will usually recommend is laying on a bench or even laying on the floor. I will give them credit. In some capacity, this is true. But as with everything in this goddamn industry, we try to see things as either black or white. In this case, as either stable or unstable. Putting movements such as push-ups, diamond push-ups, bench press and overhead press to the same level of instability as doing squats one leg at a time with a bolso ball. Stability is a spectrum. You have movements that although are not 100% stable, they are stable enough for you to produce maximal forces. Just because you're not tied up to a bench like if it was some type of BDSM stuff, that doesn't mean that you won't be able to get as much gains from that movement. On top of that, you can modify the instability of a movement by increasing its rep range. It's not the same to do dumbbell pressing with 100 pound dumbbells for a set of 5 than to do dumbbell pressing with 50 pound dumbbells for a set of 20. The latter will feel way more stable. And here I will make the argument that I haven't heard from anyone else, and that is that movements that have a slight hint of instability are actually more beneficial in terms of mobility joint integrity and overall aesthetics than movements that are 100% stable. Slightly unstable movements will target what are called stabilizer muscles, but will still allow you to produce maximum forces. The main example of this are pull-ups. If you build your back with mainly lat pull-downs, it will have a different look compared to someone that developed their back doing pull-ups. The person that does mainly pull-ups will have a more defined back, not in terms of leanness, but in terms of muscle development. They will both develop the lats, the traps, and the rear delts, but the person that did pull-ups will have developed the stabilizer muscles. On top of that, the person doing pull-ups will be strong doing lat pull-downs, but the opposite won't be true. The person doing lat pull-downs will not have nearly as much carryover to pull-ups. If all you care about is hypertrophy at the expense of everything else, you'll only use the most stable machines that take all the right biomechanical factors, greatly limiting your exercise selection and programming methods. If your gym membership ever gets canceled, your performance on many free weight classics and bodyweight exercises will suffer. You will have no skill at all. You won't be able to hang with a guy like me. But guess what? I can hang with you because my strength carries over to everything. Anything that I can lift on a barbell, I could do on the Smith machine any day without training for it. And I can max out your pressing machines on day one. The same goes for weighted chins affecting pull downs more than the other way around. The calisthenics world noted this 10 years ago. So if my standard is a 300 pound pull up for five reps, then surely if the stack maxes out at 300 pounds, it should quickly be possible, right? Yet, I'll see these experts talking trash about pull ups, doing pull downs with only around their body weight or a bit more. So if I'm doing 270 to 300 pound lap pull downs at only 165 body weight, why are you doing a fraction of that than claiming pull-ups are overrated or too unstable when you don't even know what the f instability feels like? As expected, it's hypothetical nonsense and you exposed yourself. Same thing with the iliac pull-down work sets. I learned in just a few workouts that you needed to weigh down the bench. Yet I never see these guys doing that, which again proves how weak they are. The stabilizer muscles will also help you to keep everything in its place preventing injuries, increasing mobility, because you will be stronger in more disadvantageous positions and will allow you to produce higher amounts of force, increasing the total load you are able to handle on your compound movements. So instead of pointing at a slight amount of instability on a movement as a bad thing, see it as it is, a weakness of yours. And not only that, but see that movements as the means by which you can correct said weakness. I hope I was able to drive the point home that the movements that these nerds are attacking actually bring benefits to the table that the movements that they are recommending simply do not offer. The classics are classics for a reason, because they work, and whoever tries to tell you otherwise, make sure to realize that they are either wrong or lying to you. No matter how many degrees these people have, no matter how many studies they publish, the truth of the matter is that what works works 
and what doesn't, doesn't. So until we are in 2034 and we have definite proof that iliacs are better, I'm sticking to the basics and you should as well. I hope you find this video helpful. Make sure to leave a like down below and you can always send me a DM on Instagram at Protein Man Supremacy. We're currently offering coaching services for just $30 a month. So make sure to take the opportunity and get high quality coaching for the lowest prices. Thanks for watching.